I'm more nervous when Johnny told me to come up there and put this light on like nobody else wears the light in the bathroom. Uh, that's when I broke nervous and got scared. <laughs> Y'all bear with me, I'm going to give you a little story about myself, where I've been, where I'm at now. So, uh, for y'all that don't know me, I'm John, John Wisman, 45. I'm looking to tell you a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in West Virginia. I was raised in a good home. I thought at the age I could remember. My father was a house contractor. He owned his own business, building houses. My mother worked at a closed retail store. My sister was always well, was two years older than me. Up in the hills we lived, where we lived, she was my best friend at the time. There wasn't too many people around. Neighbors was far away, so uh, she was my best friend. I was part of Baptist, went to church and Sunday school every week. When I was about six or seven years old, I could tell some things were going wrong. My mom and dad were always arguing. I didn't know what for. I was just a kid. I remember times when me and my dad would go to the camp to go hunting and fishing. He would sometimes check me out of school, and I was always just excited when he did. I knew we were going to the camp. It was uh, always fun, so I always got excited when my dad was going to check out of school. I knew it was for. I did not know at the time my dad's business was going back, bro. We were going to the camp to put food on the table when we went. I remember eating beer and fish and rice mostly every day of the week when I was a child. I remember going squirrel hunting and after the hunt, we were usually tired and pretty thirsty. The only thing my dad would have to drink was beer at the time, was slip beer, as a matter of fact. When I told my dad I was thirsty, guess what I was drinking? Shortly after that, I ended up at my dad's family to hey, hang out up the, that part of the woods at the Logan Bar. I knew when we went to the Logan Bar, I'd get a handful of quarters and go play pinball for the rest of the evening. We'd get back home sometimes with Pete, sometimes without. I think this is a lot. This is where a lot of the fighting started between my mom and my dad. There was no money for the drinking at the bar and no BP. I started drinking at an early age, skipping school in second grade at Abe's age. I skipped school. I, my dad caught me and my sister in the second grade and people would come driving down the road. He see me and my sister crossed the road wondering where we was going. He wasn't supposed to be there. We were supposed to be in school. I started smoking at the age of eight. 1980, 81, my mom and dad lost everything. The house we lived in, my dad had a brand new truck. He left it in the driveway. Me and my sister Christy was Christy was wondering what was going on. We were told we were going on vacation. We ended up here in Louisiana. That was the longest vacation I've ever been on. <laughs> so, in, so 1981, we're residents of Baton Rouge. I was eight years old. My dad found a good job and was able to get back on his feet again. I started going to Parkview Elementary in the fourth grade. In the fourth grade, my dad would leave to go to work very, very early in the morning. My mom had a job also where she had to leave before me and my sister caught the bus. Well, that year, me and my sister ended up skipping 40 days of school until the school called my parents and wanted to know what was going on. So that, that didn't go over too well at that point in my life. Me and my sister was crying pretty much the whole summer. When I got out of the fifth grade, but when I got out of the fifth grade is when uh, the state started busing kids from one side of town to the other. I was going to Alaska Middle at that time when they started busing. So I was living all the way over there by uh, Little on High School, so they were busing this way across town. Not liking it at all. I didn't like Alaska Middle. It was a lot more fast paced than like it was in the hills of West Virginia, but schools were real paid back. Not too I started riding bikes a lot, so my parents heard of a race track that was loaded. We went to Washington race one uh, Friday night. After that, I was pretty much hooked. I was hot and heavy in it for five years. I ended up being co-sponsored by Power Light, which is a bicycle dummy. I was on PM Magazines, for some of y'all that might remember PM Magazine. I was going state to state racing in nationals. I was number one in the state by the age division for a year. I had everything going my way. But at school, felt like every day was going to the office for smoking, fighting, or some kind of trouble. I ended up making some friends, but at that time I did not know it was the wrong friends. I started smoking pot and drinking, and ended up at Juvenile Hall for 
dude for two days for breaking and entering. My buddy would bring week to school. We would leave campus and get high and come back. My bicycle career and education went downhill from there. I remember we had uh, we had catched a school bus. And we would leave campus, go get go get high and walk to College Drive, store to store throughout the day. Then when the buses came back to school to pick the kids up and bring them home, we had catched the bus at that time to drive back home. So we was leaving campus all day long, going back to school to school after distance because we never caught the first bell. Never went to first class. I was being suspended on a regular basis in seventh grade of the spells. I was out of control at the time. There was an arcade room down the road from my house. It was a big weekend hangout. I remember making a little bit of money back there or getting a small allowance, but I remember buying a fifth of strawberry hill wine and a joint for the night. I remember how I got home and how you be every Friday night. A lot of the time went by when I was about 15 or 16 years old. I ended up going to Gribble Springs Hospital for two months and got clean. I was doing good, hanging out with my sister and working at Shoney's on Segan Lane. I stayed clean for two years. Time went by, ended up meeting my mother's, uh, my boy's mother. I just turned 18, she was 14. I don't know what I was thinking. Well, a few months went by, I was wondering why her eyes was always bloodshot. And I was clean two years prior to this. Come to find out she'd been smoking weed. When I found that out, when I took another turn for the worse. I slipped and started smoking and drinking again. It seemed like every day was was a party. We ended up dating for 10 years. During this time, my sister was having problems with her boyfriend and she ended up moving back to the house. We were hanging out all the time, which was awesome because she had been gone doing her thing for a long time. Then one morning in April of 1991, me and my sister Chrissy were at the house. She had some company over. He had left a while, he had left after a while, my sister called me in the room, she said that she was not feeling well. I asked her what was wrong, she says, I don't know, call 911. I said, okay, but first I'm gonna call mom. When I called my mom, she told me don't call 911. She was on her way home. My sister started to get worse, so I called Dave, who was a boyfriend for about six years. They were broke up at the time, but I asked him to come over. My sister love started losing consciousness. My mom came in a few minutes later. We ended up loading her up into the car to rush her to the hospital. She was laying in my lap in the back seat. And she looked at the, she looked, she looked up at me. She looked up at me in the back seat and said, "I love you." I didn't know that was the last words I'd ever hear come out of her mouth. We had found out she had a tubal pregnancy that erupted in her tubes. She was bleeding internally and lost blood to her brain. She had to close. She went to a cardiac arrest. She stayed in a coma for two months before we ended up making a decision that I prayed to have to make it again. We ended up having to take her off the machines after two months. The doctors never was putting up in a very hard position for our family at the time. That was a very hard time in my life. At times I blame myself wondering if I would have called 911, would she still be alive today? After her, after her passing, my addiction, my addictions were a lot worse. I got a DWI in 1994. I started going hard to drugs, pills, cocaine, to LSD, to ecstasy. Things that would erase the memory of my sister's death. Some time had passed, and I was the father of two boys. Working, spending all my money on drugs. I could never make rent or other bills. I started using crack cocaine. It was one of the worst addictions of my life. That was all I wanted to do. I wasn't there for my boys like I needed to be. All I wanted to do was get high. I didn't want to turn. I didn't want to turn it around. Well, I didn't want to do it around. So I just stayed on a lot. This caused lots of problems with my boys. We had a lot of anger and resentment towards me. We had an apartment and I went out of town to go to work and I came back home to the apartment was empty. We ended up separating and moved to Gonzales. I moved to Gonzales with some friends partying night, night and day. 
found out she ended up moving back into the apartment with another guy with my boys. I did not like the fact there was another man in the same house as my boys. That did not go well with me at all. I was high on cocaine and I just started started using pistol bus at the time. I went over and tried to kick the door in and ended up in jail for three months over that. I got out and still struggled with my addictions. I went right back to using while staying at my parents' house. In 2001, I started using pistol meth and started manufacturing it. I was still using other drugs also. It was one of the worst addictions of my life. I was injecting two grams of it a day. I sleep for weeks, looking like a wolf did. I remember trying to get a shot in my bed, falling asleep at my parents' house after being up for about seven days. My dad came in the room the next morning to wake me up, and I was trying to cover up syringes I had left out in bed. He left my room, and then I remember what I was trying to do before I fell asleep. I had a big knot on my leg and a big needle in the bed. Things started to get bad with the circle of people we associated myself, I associated with myself. Me and my buddies decided to stop manufacturing. At that point, we all went our separate ways. I gave up meth cold turkey, and my buddy ended up getting caught and did eight years fed time. Now he's a man of God, but in Barry Martin's forsake you, sharing his testimony in Illinois has been clean for 10 years. Amen. In 2002, my mother was diagnosed with brain cancer. She was going through treatments weekly. I was still using all the drugs and struggling with <clears throat> watching my mom get sicker and sicker. They decided to do surgery and I was not too thrilled about it. I don't think my parents were telling me everything that was going on with my mom. I was still living at the house, using, trying to take my mind off of things. But what, was actually, what I was actually doing was wasting my time worrying about myself and missing my mother's last days. 2003, hospitals came to the house to start help care for my mother. Then I knew, then I knew she did not have much longer. On the 16th of November, my dad came and woke me up and told me my mother has passed. It was a very horrible feeling that I lost my sister and my mother. And, um, after that, I really spun out of control. I felt very lost, very lonely. My dad was trying to do the best he could dealing with the loss of his wife and daughter and him not knowing if he was going, if I was going to be there tomorrow morning when he woke up. <laughs> I was not working a real job. I was dealing with whatever I could. My addiction, has got so, my addiction has got so bad that I started taking my dad's belongings, guns, silver, checks, from his checkbook. I was going to Home Depot using the checks to buy household, household appliances to sell them drug dealers for dope. Thank you. I remember sometimes I'd pull up on the corner and some of the guys that I was messing with at that point in time didn't like me coming around so I knew I was bringing stolen goods. There's been plenty of times that I had pistols put in my face trucks almost got stolen. Um, that ride last, didn't last long. Me and my buddy was in Shenandoah at a house that we hung out and used. We were outside fixing to get a supply of crack and a bunch of undercover cars pulled up and started questioning us. The cops said we had been watching this house for about a month and been seeing y'all come and go quite often. The police ran our names and came to, find, come to find out I had warrants for my arrest down these Baptist Parish prison I went. <clears throat> my charges were possession of paraphernalia, counterfeit money, and forgery. Come to find out my dad ended up pressing charges on me for stealing the checks where the forgery charge came from, which I don't blame him. I ended up going a year and a half in prison. The charges were felony charges, <clears throat> which at times had made it hard to get my twig card that I needed for work. When I was released, I was going fine for a while, but still drinking pretty heavy. Thinking, thinking everything was fine, living back at my dad's house. <laughs> he ended up selling the house we had in Baton Rouge and bought some property out in Gonzales. He told me there was just too many memories in the house and he had to sell it. It did not take long living out in Gonzales. I was going down the wrong road again. I knew a lot of people out there. Most was the wrong crowd. It was about six months and I was back in the heart of the again. 
I was going pretty bad taking things that did not belong, that belonged to my dad selling them for drugs. One morning I was at the house sleeping and I heard a bedroom door open. There was a Central Parish Sheriff's Office telling me not to move my hands where they are so they could see them. I knew that my dad had called the sheriff and he <clears throat> on me that morning. He did it for my own good. He did not want him to lose his last child when there was something he could do about it. At this time I was sentenced to six months in a Central Parish Jail. 2006, while I was doing my time, I heard about a place called the Home of Grace. I heard there you could go do. <clears throat> I heard there you could go there and, and do three months of your sentence, and that was a good good days program. Also, <clears throat> I was like Nicky explained it the other day. I knew there was a God, but never had a personal relationship with Him. So the judge granted me to go there. I had to complete the program. I was there for about a month and a half, and I ended up giving my life to the Lord. I was really getting to know him on a personal level. I was going to church eight times, eight times in a week, and taking biblical classes four, times, four days out of the week when I was in the Home of Grace. At the hall, which they call the hall of the Home of Grace, or the Home of Grace, they call it the hall. Pumps the word in as much as possible. They try to keep the flow in. My heart was really hard when I first got there, of course. I really, did, I really did not want to be there. But I knew the other option was either going a lot of time in prison or death. So that's when I started working the program. I ended up graduating and completing the program. My dad came to get me on graduation day, and I remember going down Jericho Drive weeping. I knew that I had just spent 90 days in a bubble, being protected by a prayer, a prayer and a lot of men of God. And now I'm back in the world again. I don't think 40 months went by. <clears throat> And I was going to Jimmy Swaggers on Sundays, driving my dad's truck because he didn't he didn't attend church too much, so he let me borrow his truck when I got out of there to go to Swaggers Ministries off what that do. For what reason I don't know the devil had a hold of me when I left service on Sunday. Instead of going home, I went by and seen one of my old drug dealers. So it all started again. My dad had no clue at this time. He was helping me get my truck and get back on my feet. I knew I was going wrong, but I, I could not let it go. When I got my truck, things got bad to worse. Staying out late, not even coming home at all. I was going down Highway 621 in Gonzales at about 2 a.m. in the morning to make a drug deal. I looked down and was fixing what I had to deliver and I swerved off in the ditch and hit a bolt. I was able to drive my truck, my truck to a restaurant and park it behind a dumpster. I was looking for what I had because it flew out of my lap. I seen headlights pull in and I knew what it was. Someone had called the police on me. I hid behind a dumpster and walked around. He had, I hid behind a dumpster and he had walked around and asked me what I was doing. I told him I was trying to get home and he had asked my ID. My address on the license at that time was on 6.1, about a half a mile down the road from where this happened. But I did not actually live there anymore. He said, since it's so late, I'll just drop you off and you can come back and get your truck tomorrow. I waited till he had left and I stole a bicycle and rolled back to, rolled back to the store and told the dealer to come get me. At this time, I knew the Lord had his hand over top of me. My dad ended up going to get my truck the next day since it was in his name. It was still drivable, but it had a bus and tire in around. I stayed gone for about a week. <clears throat> I stayed gone for about a week. I came home and put the spare tire on the truck and left. When my dad called the law, I was arrested for unauthorized use of a movable, movable and I did three months in jail. In 2008, after I was released, I ended up going to my dad's house. He was at work when I knew how to get in the house, but I did not think it was a good idea, so I sat on the porch and waited for him to get home. When he got there, he asked me what I was doing. I told him I was releasing, I was clean, and I needed his help at this point. I was free from drugs. I sat around the house for weeks, wanting to go back to work. LSI, come, LSI the company I used to work for, I owed over $1,000 to. He used to give us a per diem and travel check before he left to go out of town. One time I was asked, asked to go out of town for a week and I cashed the check but never went on the job. So they gave me a thousand dollars but I never went on the job. So my dad worked for the same company and was given another I was given another opportunity to go back and work with him. I knew that all I, all of that money that I owed was going to be pulled out of my first check. 
I think I worked 70 hours that whole week and I ended up going in a $46 check after the dumpster. Mm -hmm. I paid my back whatever I owed. If I didn't care, I was glad to be working. I was ready to get back on my feet. Well, the first day of the job, we were sitting in the parking lot waiting on the rest of the crew. And I seen a girl that I knew for a while that never got to know her. Her name was Nick James. We ended up working that job together. And at the end of the job, I asked her if she wanted to come spend some time on the weekend and hang out with me. And she said yes. So that evening, she came to the house and she still never left. <laughs> At that time, I did not know, know it, but it was one of the biggest blessings of my life. Although I was staying clean from drugs, I still had an alcohol addiction. I was still drinking hard liquor and beer. I had a good friend of mine, his name was Nathan. We have always been good friends, and he seen me struggle with my drug addiction. We were always separated because of it because we were just drinking buddies. Since I was clean from drugs, me and Nathan hung out a lot drinking fishing and going to fall with each other. The hard liquor had started to take a, a toll on me and Dickie's relationship. I was spending too much time at the bars, more at the ballroom than with Dickie. Well, it didn't take long. Dickie sat me down and told me it was either her or the liquor. It was my decision. It was not a hard decision to figure out, so I quit drinking hard liquor, but not beer. We were going good still working together, trying to save money for our own place to live. My boys were having a hard time living with their mother as she was battling addictions also. We ended up getting full custody of my oldest son, Dylan. I was happy that I was able to have him living with me again, being that I was not in his life too much when he was a small boy. My youngest son would come to stay with us on the weekends during the summer. It was awesome having the boys around. In 2009, we ended up moving out to Walker in a three-bedroom trailer. We did not only move into the three-bedroom trailer just for the room, we were expecting a little baby girl named Ava. Mm -hmm. Things were great in my mind, still drinking my beer, going with John wanted to do. I did not realize that it was starting to destroy my relationship with Nicky. As time went by, everything was good for a while, but shortly the boys started showing disrespect towards Nicky. I was being too easy on them, not correcting them at all or the right way. Not only that, I would be drunk and not here. It wasn't their fault. They never had too much structure or rules to follow their entire life, but it caused a lot of fighting between everyone. March 11th, 2010, we were at the house cooking and I got a phone call. It was Nathan's wife called me saying that they were in a big fight. I talked to him earlier that day, it was his birthday, so I called to wish him a happy birthday. He told me him and his wife, wife had been at the bar since early morning. They'd been there all day, still there. When I talked to him, he said he was drunk, he was ready for bed. And I asked him if he wanted me to come get him and take him home, but he said no. So his, walk, his wife called that night to tell me they were fighting really bad. I asked her if she wanted me to talk to him, and she said, no, no, no. I will. I said, okay, call me if you need me. So early the next morning, I get a phone call telling me Nathan had shot himself in the head. Oh my God. That was very hard for me to take in that I just lost my best friend. He was supposed to be the best man at our wedding. My drinking started to get a lot worse. I was trying to drink away all the pain from three people I lost in my life. A month later, on April 24th, 2010, me and Nikki got married in a little chapel in Lamar Dixon. When she walked down the aisle, I was trying to figure out how I got so lucky. I'm still trying to figure it out every now <laughs> After our wedding, my drinking and the fighting began to take its toll on Nikki. There were weeks I worked all week and would only have about $40 left to spend. My daily drinking habit was way more important. Around this time when Nikki started going to New Day, is when Nikki started going to New Day, she was always asking me to go, but I was always had plans on Sundays to drink with my buddies. I got to the point where I would even have my boys with me, drinking throughout the day, even late in the night and driving. I was never helping out with Ava. Me and Nikki started fighting a lot. And she would and she would go stay at her mom's house for a week, for a week or so at a time. 
I would try to convince her that things would get better to come back to the house. I did not last long, she'd be right back to her mom. I was also trying to convince myself that things were going good. In 2012, we filed our taxes. I was going to get a refund for around five grand. I figured it was time to party. My young son, Chris, ended up going back to stay with his aunt, Jenny. And Dylan went back to live with his mom. With me and Nikki battling with our marriage and all of the fighting between the boys, Nikki, it was the best thing for him at the time. One evening, me and Nikki got into an argument and I ended up leaving. Nathan's wife had called as soon as I left the house and said she was down from Montana, so I went to visit her. I really was not too good. It wasn't a good visit at all. Come to find out she was uh, already with another man and pregnant. And it probably been a, year, it's been a year. It really hurt me. I didn't understand how she could move on so fast. Best was my head because I was still grieving for the loss of my best friend. After that, I went to stay at my dad's house for about two months. I was bar hopping every night, going through our tax money like it was nothing. In the two months, I spent all of our tax money on alcohol. I'd go to dad's every night, laying in bed, praying that things would get better. But I knew I had to start with me first. I called Nikki and asked her, or asked her, if I was sober, could I come back to the house? And she said yes. We were sitting around outside talking about me getting help. She asked me if I'd be willing to go back to rehab. I said, I, I, I agree, I need help. We were trying to hang on my marriage. I told her if I went, I would like to go back to the home of grace. I knew there was something there that I needed. Financially, we could not afford the home of grace because it's $6,000 for the 90 days. But the Lord had plans. Is going to make way he did. That day I called my cousin and asked him if I could borrow the money and told him what my, and told him my plan was, what my plan was. He knew my past and said to give him a few days to think about it. He called me back within an hour and told me yes, he'd give me the money to go. It was a 90 day program and I was so worried how Nikki was going to pay me. When I was in rehab, Nikki had started paying her ties. Not only did God take a way for me to go to rehab, he also provided her financial blessing. So it's never too late. <clears throat> she was never late with one bill for those 90 days, but just her only income. And before I left, when I was working, he barely got by. I knew when I got to the home of grace, I knew exactly what to do. There had to be more of him and less of me. I ended up rededicating myself to him again. And I was really focused on turning myself back over to his will. While I was there, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me daily. I was sitting around one evening when I first got there and I seen some guys who was about to graduate. And you could just see how the Lord had just, was just shining off of them. Their cup was overflowing and their candle wicks were trimmed. It was almost my graduation day and I passed by the same spot where I was sitting when I first got there. I seen a guy looking at me. I started thinking how I was in the same position 90 days ago. My cup was empty. My wick wasn't going up but putting off soot. And I was thinking how he was seeing my life and by the way I was getting myself that my cup was overflowing and I was, and I was feeling It was a feeling I never felt before. I graduated, and Nikki and Ava and my dad came to bring me home. It was awesome knowing that the marriage was being restored. I called my cousin and talked to him about repaying him the $6,000, and he said the only repayment he wanted was me to stay sober. So I'm so grateful my pastor was working with Nikki while I was gone. And sticking with recovery class for two years after I got out. I want to say thank you and I love you for that. Mm -hmm. Got a couple scriptures I want to tell you. Galatians 5 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled with, again with the yoke of bondage. Amen. 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 Galatians 2 20. I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Yeah. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave me and gave himself for me. Amen. Knowing that if you put your flesh aside and put Jesus first, anything is possible. Addictions and chains can be broken, marriages can be restored, and the past can be behind you. Right. And I give God all the glory for that. Amen.